Well, hello folks, and welcome to another uh, Tool Time episode. Um, we'll try and fit these in whenever we can, uh, taking in bits of machinery around the workshop, what they do, where we got them from, because um, they're all different sources around the place, uh, what we use them for, what the pros and cons are, just a bit of background really, might be useful to somebody at home, might not be, you never know. So, uh, But this week, we are gonna have a little look at our bead roller. Uh, this we've had for a little while now, I couldn't tell you exactly how long, probably about three or four years, this particular one, we've had various other ones in the past. Um, this we got from, <laughs> as you can see by the stickers on it, uh, Matt at Stakesy's Metalworking Machinery. Uh, we buy quite a bit of our machinery from Stakesy's, not all of it, because we buy quite a lot of old secondhand stuff as well. Um, but anything new tends to come from Matt. Uh, he's very good. We've known him for quite a long time. He started his business about the same time that we started ours. Um, so we've sort of grown up in parallel a little bit and he's a very, very helpful chap. Um, just really good in general. Anyway, back to the bead roller. Um, this is a fairly heavy duty machine uh, in terms of bead rollers. Um, in terms of sort of fairly small uh, modern ones that aren't all a cast iron construction. Uh, it will put beads very easily into 18 gauge steel. I think it would just about cope with 16 gauge, but that would probably be pushing it a bit past its uh, capacity. But it would certainly put a, a bead using that type of roll into uh, 18 gauge very easily. We do that pretty regularly with it. Um, so what do we use it for? Uh, the, <laughs> what, Every, other people might use it for and what we primarily use it for could be two slightly different things here because you have to bear in mind to put the things in context that we have this machine and we also have uh, Henry Pell's nibbler which w would generally be known in the metalwork world as a pull max type machine which is a reciprocating it's not a hammer people call them hammers it's a reciprocating machine it was originally designed as a nibbler for cutting circles out of big pieces of metal before the days of lasers and cnc plasmas and the like and um, so it was originally designed for cutting out circles from steel um, but it has a, a approximately a yard throat on it um, and it's very easy to make dies for it so then you can hammer shapes into pieces of metal uh, sort of flutes into door panels and things like that you can do all sorts of jobs with that as well as cutting with it and other jobs um, so we kind of use this in tandem with that and the two have their benefit have pros and cons both of them have pros and cons the pro the main pros with the nibbler the henry powell's machine uh, is that will cope with very very thick material you know you can put a bead into two millimeter thick steel uh, very easily with that machine with you know no problem problems at all whereas clearly these rollers will not do that however because it's a reciprocating machine it vibrates and trying to manually feed an accurate line without an edge guide is extremely difficult so you have to have an edge guide with that machine you can't freehand anything in it whereas on these you can freehand very easily so what we tend to do with this is freehand work following a line that we've marked on or edge guide work that is difficult to do in the Paul Max Henry Pell's type reciprocating machine, <clears throat> which is largely turning edges on curved sections. This does the job more neatly and in a more gradual fashion than the um, reciprocating machine. So we use it for turning edges onto slightly more complicated shapes, putting basically flanging edges. Um, we use it for freehand beading. We've got the beading rolls in there at the moment, they're quarter inch beading rolls. We would use it for freehand beading panels um, where we want to just follow a line. We don't want to set up an edge guide or have some guidance system. We just want to manually look at the roll, guide the panel through and just follow a line. Um, and we also use it for occasionally for putting um, steps into panels, joggled steps. If we're doing, um, obviously you can fold those, you can put those on a folder, but if we're doing a, a stepped panel where we want a, a lap joint, it's not very often we do them, but when we want a lap joint, if it needs bends in the lap joint, we'll use these with a set of step rolls in. Uh, I'll show you the other rollers. We have those which are the step rolls for creating lap joints again these can then go around the benefit to them is obviously you can do a lap joint with bends in it uh, that's the advantage to using those the beading rolls which are in now quarter inch beading rolls for putting reinforcing beads in or just sort of beads to put shapes and pretty things into a panel uh, then we have the edge tipping rolls which i'll show here which are those two where you locate the sheet 
piece of sheet metal will show these in a short while, um, actually doing some uh, edge tipping with these. But basically, you locate the sheet into that step there, like that, and then this roll comes down and sorry, that way around, and folds the edge and basically creates a, a, a flange on the edge of a piece of metal. Again, if it was a straight line, you'd just do it in the folder. But if it's a profile shaped piece, then, yeah, and you need to go around corners, that's where this comes into its own. And as I say, it's a little bit more controllable than the uh, reciprocating machine. And then finally, the other thing that we do quite a bit in this machine, if I get this set of rolls, is for tank rolls, which are these which basically put a radius bend right onto the edge of a piece of sheet. Again, in a straight line, you would just use a radius bar in the folder to put that on. But the benefit to the tank roll is you can actually go around a corner with it and you can put a radius uh, edge, radius bend, onto a curve, uh, which is particularly useful for a few applications. The one that we use probably most commonly here is making wheel arch tubs. Um, if you want to make a, an inner arch tub for a car, uh, for, the, for an inner wheel arch, for example, on the Escort, that's where we do them quite regularly is on Ford Escorts. Um, you have the, the horizontal piece that contains the wheel, and then you have the vertical piece for the inner face. Where the two meet, obviously, you don't particularly want a 90 degree corner. It's not very pretty. You can't really weld around a 90 degree corner very neatly. It looks a mess. Um, so you want to make a neat way of that meeting. So what you want to do is basically get your two pieces of metal and tip them into a slight radius at the corner, then weld along the radius, clean it up, and it'll just look very, very like a very neat little curved corner. And in order to do that, you would use a set of tank rolls. Um, so that's why we have those. So that pretty much uh, summarizes all of the rollers. Uh, in terms of a bit more detail on the machine, um, you can buy these in manual, uh, hand-cranked format, which this was originally when we got it, uh, or you can buy them electrically powered. Now, Matt does both, the Stexies do both um, setups, but you can, can, you can retrofit, if you buy a manual one and then decide later you want to retrofit the electric control, then that's also possible. That's what we've actually done here. Um, the, the electric control is pretty indispensable, I have to say. The, the, manually cranking a machine of this throat depth on your own and keeping this end of the job accurate is extremely difficult. Uh, it's much easier to be able to do it via motor control. I've always been a bit concerned because the bead rollers I'd used in the past were very clunky in their motor control, very difficult to be smooth with, very difficult to be gradual with, very easy to make a mess of things. I have to say this is not at all the case. Uh, with this machine, it's extremely smooth. Um, I mean, it, it's turned on now, it's on a low speed setting. You have a, an on off, no volt release switch here, um, which, uh, so that if, the, if you have a power cut, the machine's dead, you know, for the safety, safety thing there, it's, uh, it's dead if it has a power cut, you have to restart it. Then it has a little uh, inverter control uh, to fire the uh, uh, pulse, pulses to the motor to control the motor, uh, and then a foot pedal which starts and stops it and obviously and has a pedal for each direction to control the uh, the direction of the rollers um, i mean i can just demonstrate now you can see how slow and steady that is i can actually slow that down even more down to that sort of level where you can barely see it moving you know it's incredibly slow and then i can wind that all the way up And it actually has enough power, or, or pretty much all, unless it's at the very bottom of that speed range, the point where it's barely visibly moving, it has enough power to put a bead into 18 gauge steel, even at extremely low speed um, with that setup. So I can fully recommend it. It works extremely well. We've used it quite a bit now. We've put a lot of um, stepped swages into panels on, on a couple of cars that we're able to show the reverse. Um, yeah, we've put a lot of step swages into uh, a couple of cars we're building at the moment, um, which were very big pieces. They're actually slightly too big to get into. The throat was actually slightly too small on this machine. I can't remember what the throat depth is. It's quite, but as you can see, substantial. And it was actually slightly too big to fit in there. There were such big pieces. Um, but the, we managed to get around that by going in both directions around it and meeting up. And the control was superb. Tom was beading those pieces on his own in this. Um, and he's not a he's not a big chap, um, and he managed those absolutely no problem at all. So yeah, ten out of ten in terms of control. 
As with all the non-cast iron machines, it'd be nicer if the machine was a bit more rigid, but it's plenty rigid enough for anything you're really likely to need to do, certainly on a hobbyist basis, and in re reality for anything we're doing in automotive work-wise, it's plenty sturdy enough. And my only other observation that could do with improvement, but would be easy to improve at home, is the edge guidance. We don't really use the edge guide very much, but I'd have to say that the edge guide on this machine isn't brilliant. It uses a little roller bearing on an adjustment bracket along the back here. And I've always found with the roller bearings, unless they have a V to them, you tend to find that the piece of metal that you're guiding rolls up the roller and comes off the top of it. Uh, and it tends not to stay on the roller. Um, and it's very easy to mess a piece up because it's slid off the edge guide. So I think the edge guy could do with a bit of improvement, but that's a minor sort of uh, a minor gripe really. In the, it's very easy to improve that, and if we actually use the edge guide very much, we would just improve it. We actually made a sliding shoe edge guide for. Um, this machine's predecessor, the old bead roller that we had, which was also from Stacey. Um, but that, we, we had that many. We bought that probably in, I don't know, 2010, I should think. Um, uh, we actually improved the edge guide on that. We, we made like a sliding shoe edge guide on that one, which worked quite well. We don't generally use the edge guide on this, so it doesn't really matter. It's all academic, and I have to say, any, niggle, any gripes about that are more than outweighed by the uh, electric drive, which is absolutely superb really well thought out absolutely faultless in operation i really can't recommend that highly enough so that's uh, pretty much a quick summary of the machine uh, oh last last thing sorry which i missed is that um to change the rolls there's a pair of bolts in the ends of the shafts here you just undo those the rolls slide off they've got a drive pin on the back if i rotate them a bit we'll probably be able to see if I go around, you may be able to see it. Yes, uh, just visible on the back there. There's a, there's a drive pin on the back. I'll oh, come all the way around so you can see it under here. There we go. See a drive pin on the back of the roller there. Uh, and then there's a collar, a threaded collar, which you can slacken the grub screws off on, or the pinch screws off on, and then wind that back and forth. And that sets the shoulder depth on this top roll to set the roll alignment top to bottom so you can center them exactly to make sure your bead is exactly centered or your step if you're doing a step roll to make sure your step is exactly uh, stepped correctly um, so yeah very easy to adjust doesn't take long all brilliant uh, all the adjustments are great it basically is a really nice bit of kit uh, does a superb job so at that point i guess we'll show it uh, the machine in action with me making a few bits and bobs on it uh, just to demonstrate sort of the, the main things we use it for. So here we've got the uh, tipping rolls or flanging rolls as they're also called um, and we're going to put a 90 degree flange on the end of this piece along a curved edge. Uh, it's like a 180 degree cur uh, curve. And we're going to put a, a flange all the way along so we're doing the first pass first um, which would be about a third of the depth of the final I couldn't give you an exact angle but it's about a third of the depth of the final uh, piece uh, or the final final angle obviously we're taking it to 90 degrees and this will take it about a third of the way there on the first pass you can see the part I'm keeping the uh, piece of steel close into the shoulder on the rolls um, you have to keep that tight into that shoulder that's the probably the only point where a degree of accuracy and competence is needed really is to make sure that that piece of metal doesn't slip away from the guide shoulder on the roll uh, and that's the bit that it's e where it's easiest to go wrong it's not too easy to go wrong but it's the bit where it's easiest to go wrong so here we're doing the second pass along the part uh, and getting that a little bit closer to 90 degrees again not not all the way there but it's just carrying out a second pass uh, to get it to uh, part way through. You could probably do this job in two passes, but that's just putting the second. And then here's the final pass, which is uh, taking it all the way to 90 degrees. You can see that's really taking the part round. Now, at this point, the metal will come away from the shoulder a little bit uh, as you're feeding it through, because just because of the angle. Um, it, but that, by this point, it doesn't really matter. The, 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 the rolls will, will guide themselves along the bottom of the groove uh, as it's so well defined already now. And there you can see that's fully through to 90 degrees. Yeah, nice crisp edge. A couple of wobbles due to my clumsiness, but uh, yeah, ni nice flange all the way around the part. And uh, yeah, good finish. And yeah, that's ready for a bit of uh, metal finishing and all done. So then we'll show a quick, uh, a quick roll changeover at that point. Uh, sped up, it's very easy, a couple of bolts to undo, slide the rolls off, slide the new rolls on, make sure they engage with the pins, uh, and then set the threaded collar before you tighten the top roll all the way up, uh, put it on, leave the top bolt loose, 
adjust the threaded collar to align the rolls, check the alignment, adjust the threaded collar backwards and forwards until the alignment's dead on, and then tighten up the main bolt holding the top roll, tighten up the collar, well, sorry, tighten up the collar first, then tighten up the, top, the bolt holding the top roll on the shaft, and there you have your roll changeover complete. So now we're going to have a uh, go with the tank rolls, and again, this will be a couple of passes uh, to get the finished uh, result into the piece. You could probably do it in one pass, but there's no point making life too difficult. Um, again, the, the part self-guiding, you just make sure it doesn't come away from the shoulder on the roll. Keep, keep, the, uh, keep the piece of steel comfortably against the shoulder on the roller. This is making the vertical face of a, a wheel arch tub. Um, and uh, yeah, again, feeding it round, making sure that the, uh, the edge is kept against the shoulder on the roll, uh, make sure that it's fed nice and smoothly, but it's all pretty easy to do really. On, on this particular part, uh, the edge is these replasma cut parts, and I hadn't actually cleaned the hardened edge off the roll, so it was actually putting a slight mark on the roller when I was doing these, which was uh, a bit naughty, but it's, it won't have done any lasting damage to them. Um, so yeah, first pass through. So here we are doing the second pass through, or the final pass through now, um, just taking that corner round to the uh, to a quarter of basically to 45 degrees effectively, taking it to the uh, to the half radius. Um, and so obviously this would then be welded to another part with the other half of the radius on to form the full 90 degree bend with a with a half inch internal radius. Now you can see the uh, the half the, the the 45 degree half inch radius formed on the part really neatly. So here we're just showing a bit of freehand beading using the bead rolls. I've just sort of loosely put a put a marked a line on the uh, on the part, and I'm just going to follow it along as best I can. I'm not uh, not the most fluent with these, but I'm just going to uh, roughly follow that line along. Just demonstrate a bit of freehand beading, um, just to show that you you know you can you can do that sort of thing with them. As you can see, we've also done a little reinforcing bead around the edge of this panel but uh, just freehand following a line, it's pretty easy, it's very controllable, and means you can do all sorts of des designs, should you wish, on parts, um, just, just freehand designs, just draw them on the part and then follow them around with the rollers. So yeah, that's, uh, that's just a, a quick demonstration of uh, how, 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 the how the quarter inch beading rolls work. Well, folks, uh, hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into what a bead roller is. Um, I imagine you probably knew before we started, but what a bead roller is, what it can do to some extent. Obviously, there's hundreds of things you can do with a bead roller. Use your, you, you can use your imagination to do all sorts of things, but what we use it for, the main principal operations that we do with it, uh, where we got it from, how it, how it is to use in general, and a little bit of a, a general flavour of things, hopefully useful to somebody making, doing a little work, setting up a little workshop at home, doing a bit of restoration work at home, or in the early stages of maybe setting up a business like we were years ago, um, give you a little bit of a flavour of the machine so you've got a, a little bit of knowledge. Uh, hopefully it's been helpful, uh, and see you all again with another little episode soon.